right. Cool. Looks like we're live. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone that's been waiting. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, today we have another a great demo for you today. And um, we, we have some special guests, some, some members of the team, Gravity Sketch, some Gravity Sketch professional uh, you know, experts. And um, uh, they're going to be doing a, a really in-depth demo today, just showing how to create some roller blades. But uh, I'll defer to Austin and Nico uh, to talk a little bit more about in detail what they want to show. But um, yeah, just thank you for joining us. Uh, quick introduction of myself. I'm Jaron Dorman. Uh, I'm the design community manager at Gravity Sketch, and I get to connect with all of you out there, the community, and just get to highlight the amazing work that you're doing. Um, and so it's just a pleasure to talk to you and, and meet all of you out there. Um, without further ado, I'm just going to pass it along to uh, Austin, and then we can go to Nico. If you guys want to just really quickly introduce yourselves, what you do, at Gravity Sketch, and then what we'll be focusing on today. But before that, I just want—I just remembered I want to say one more thing that um, we'll be joining in VR, so we're going to switch over to VR after this little intro. And um, Nico, Austin, and myself are actually going to be in VR together using Colab, and I just want to do a quick plug and say that Colab is now available for everybody. So if you want to get into Colab and you want to start dipping your toe into that, invite, inviting your friends, your colleagues, um, and start using Gravity Sketch, making stuff together, like what you're going to see today. Um, you can start using that right now. Go to Landing Pad and, and start adding um, adding your friends' Landing Pad emails to your list and uh, and start collaborating. So I just want to do a quick little plug there, and we'll talk more about that later. But yeah, Austin, if you want to just go first and introduce yourself. Sure. So hi, I'm Austin. I'm the lead design consultant at Gravity Sketch, and I do a lot of trainings with customers that we have and also just some fun videos and stuff to show people how to utilize Gravity Sketch to the best of their abilities. Um, I'm also a footwear specialist, so that's kind of part of how um, Nico and I came up with this idea. And I'm going to pass it to Nico to talk more about the idea when he introduces himself because it's really his brainchild. Hey, everyone. My name is Nico DePere. I'm an industrial design consultant at uh, Gravity Sketch as well. I uh, work in automotive and across, uh, across all the industries, actually. Um, prior to joining Gravity Sketch, I had never really done much in footwear, but now uh, I've had a lot of experience with footwear. And um, over the last year, uh, I kind of had this idea that I always want to do a rollerblade in Gravity Sketch, and time was a little short. Um, but uh, I love rollerblading. Uh, when I was studied in Paris every Friday night and Sunday, there are these huge groups of people who get together and they rollerblade around the city. And it's a great way to see the city. Um, and back, let's say this was like 15 years ago, I got myself a pair of um, Fila Nighthawks uh, and they were just a really cool rollerblade and um, always kind of wanted to do the next version of them from a designer standpoint. And so kind of fusing industrial design, transportation design and footwear design together uh, Austin and I kind of came up with this idea to do a collab session around a rollerblade. So we hope uh, hope it'll be interesting and you'll get something out of it today. I just want to say one more thing too before we jump into VR. If anybody has any questions during the demo for Austin or for Nico, um, general gravity sketch questions, um, please just put them in the chat and I'll be monitoring that in VR while we're going. So I'll be happy to shoot those questions over um, to Austin or Nico. Um, so we encourage all conversation throughout um, and, and happy to answer your questions. So uh, don't be shy. For sure. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and switch over. I can just switch the feed here. Let's see here. And, uh, and we'll be off. I'm just going to give me, I'm just going to switch over my headset. Awesome. Are we switched over? Okay, we're good. If you want to just go ahead, Austin, and uh, hello, and start. Yeah, I'm Austin. In, this is my Austin avatar. Um, and so for today's demo, oh, if we're... you guys are speaking, 
Um, oh, I am speaking. I'm not getting you through the through the uh, through the call. If you just want to double check your audio source. You're not getting me, Nico. Or I mean, I Jane. Can... Jane, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Good. Perfect. Can you, can you get right. can you hear me now? Is yeah, you guys. Are? Yeah, you both are good. All right. All right. Perfect. So I was just quickly saying that um, we're going to start today's demo as mostly sketch based. So we'll do like this in kind of a series. And today we're going to start from scratch, like sketching our ideas. And we might get into a little bit of surfacing, but the main thing is we're going to start sketching. And I always like I'm going to work on the upper and Nico's going to start down at the bottom um, in like as doing the chassis of the rollerblade. And I always like to start with a super rough sketch um, and then turn that on translucent and then do something that's a little bit more refined. So that's what you'll see me doing. Awesome. Let's see here. I'm just gonna pin this so I can see the chat coming through. Um, yeah, so the, we, we thought one of the cool things would just be able to uh, show all of you out there watching um, how maybe two people are working together on something in collab. Uh, and so as Austin mentioned, um, we've, got, we've got sort of the workload split up. Um, and I think another reason why this was picked too, and forgive me if, if it was mentioned already, but there's you know, some soft goods as well as hard surface modeling uh, aspects to to a rollerblade. So I think um, makes it a perfect subject to to cover like all the uh, tools that you might use in gravity sketch, the workflows. Um, and so Austin, right now, you're just doing that rough sketch basically around the last, it looks like, um, in symmetry mode as well. Yeah, as see. I have mirror on so that even though both sides of a shoe are not exactly the same, especially when you're doing the rough sketch part of it, I find it really, um, really easy to have it just mirror on both sides and then I can edit it as I need to when I'm done to get it to um, fit the lash shape a little bit better. And this really like, it just saves on time a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, I don't have to sketch this on, on both sides. I can just do one side and then um, and, and I feel like sketching in 3D in general saves on a lot of time because I'm not doing like multiple perspectives. I'm only having to draw just around the last one time and then I just move it around and kind of, um, I can take screenshots or, it, I mean, you know, do whatever I want with the enti entirety of the shoe. But um i also find it to be really beneficial because there's a lot of things that i'll sketch in 2d that i won't realize like doesn't work until i get into like trying to draw it on a last and then i'm like oh this last shape's not going to work for that or whatever so this is really really nice to have you're immediately doing it in 3d right on the last shape that like you are planning on using which um you know helps you kind of achieve any problem solving stuff right away yeah also the the sketching in mirror mode like this and then moving to asymmetry later was a little bit tricky before because there wasn't really a way to multi select mul like multiple strokes and remove the mirror or remove the symmetry and um, you can now do that and so we'll, we'll obviously see that uh, at a later time here um, but it totally makes this workflow valid, um, just that little feature. And that came at the request of just a lot of people in the community. Um, of everybody? <laughs> yeah, basically everybody. <laughs> yeah, and so it's just like, I just wanna say that all of your requests and your wish lists, everything, we reread all of that stuff. And, um, and we try and uh, put it through some filters, you know, big filters are just like, is this a gravity sketch tool? Does this make sense for what you know gravity sketch is as a tool uh, overall? And then, you know, 
uh, is there another way this can be done? Um, does it need to be a new feature? Does it need to be a new tool? Um, and you know, it, what's the feasibility? Can we build it? There's just all kinds of things that we consider, um, but we do consider them for sure. And uh, just really our, our whole goal and our whole uh, agenda is to create a tool that is for all of you, that uh, works, works for, your, for your workflows and, and keeps, you, keeps you creative, doesn't get in your way. So now you can kind of see how I did a really, really rough sketch. And I'm not proud of my rough sketches. Those are always um, more of a reference for me than anything else. And then now I'm going to go in and use the actual stroke tool, which is a lot more like vector lines and illustrator to, um, to be a lot more precise with what I want to do here. So there's a question from Ken Peel uh, says, Sometimes exporting a mirrored sketch flips normals. Is there a way to make sure I'm modeling on the correct sides, normal or texture side? Um, that's a great question. I, I actually haven't observed that myself. Um, that's interesting. Uh, we'll have to look into that, see if that's like some sort of bug, you know, for with exporting. But um, to answer your question, though, there is a way to check the normals of, uh, of surfaces. Um, so if I just create like a quick surface here, um, this, will, this will actually be a good opportunity to educate a little bit on, on flip normals and gravity sketch. So you can see I drew this, this sort of really rough tube shape. Um, I'm just gonna convert this to sub D just so you can see this. So if I go into edit mode here and I click the little hammer and paintbrush icon and I go over to, uh, actually, sorry, um, not in edit mode. I don't know why I was, it's actually here in the tool belt. So um, I'll grab the normals tool, which is this one that has like a little white ball at the end of it. And you can see that we're, we're seeing the material on one side and then we're seeing through it on the inside. So this tells you um, that the normals are correct because the inside is transparent and the outside is opaque. Um, this all depends on actually how you originally drew the, the surface. So if I'll just show you an example. So if I go ahead and pull towards me and draw this way, or, uh, and then this one will be starting the other way. So this one, I went up and down, I went down and up with this other one. So if I grab the normals, you can see that one is reversed and one is not. So basically it's all in how you draw the surface. Um, and I think we're working on a better way to, I think, educate um, and make it really clear as to what side you're working with when you're working with sub D. And um, to flip the normals, you simply just take the normals tool and you touch it and as soon as it turns red, click the trigger and it will flip the normals there for you. So um, before you export, Ken, if, uh, if you just grab this normals tool, it should show you all the surfaces that are flipped and, uh, and you should be able to just click them and flip them. Let's see. Yeah, I will say that I did experience um, some stuff that I was doing in mirrored tool maybe like a month ago where the normals got flipped and um, I was able to solve it by um, just breaking all my mirrors and gravity sketch and then re-exporting. Um, and that actually kept all my normals in the right spot. But I think that might have been um, resolved actually at this point. Okay. Or that, that doesn't need to be done anymore. Okay, awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, Lu Lewis Lockett. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad this is like the first time you're seeing the feature. Um, yeah, so basically everybody can use this now. And the way you use it is you just go on landing pad and um, you go to your, your workspace. It'll be your name and workspace at the top left. And you just click that and there's a, a rooms tab or I guess actually, a, um, yeah, I believe it's rooms. And then you click on your room and then you'll be able to add people that have access to that room. And all they need is a, their, all you'll need is their landing pad email and you can invite them. And then you'll have that list of people you've invited. You can invite as many people as you want to have access to your room. Although we do have a cap of 
four participants at any one time in, in CoLab. Um, and then the, the, the true power of it is, is that um, they can also give access, give you access to their rooms, which means you could theoretically have an endless um, number of CoLab rooms to, to collaborate with, um, but you only get one room for yourself to control. So that's one of the key things that we want to make sure that we always convey is you, you have one personal room and then an infinite amount of other rooms that you can have access to, um, only limited by the amount of friends that you have. Um, let's see here. So you got the sketch just really coming together here. It seems like it's really fleshing out all the details. I see, Nico, you've got the wheels going as well as sketching out, I guess, the framework for... Um, I don't even know what you call that. What, 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 what's the word for this, like, this mechanism that holds the wheels? I'm sure there's like an official term for it. Chassis. Chassis. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Chassis or hangers. Sweet. So we're in the sketching phase here already. We seem to be getting a pretty solid design direction. Um, yeah, this actually like... To be honest, after even after like many years of using Illustrator, I feel like I can sketch something in 3D now, like just as quickly as I can in Illustrator. Um, as far as like the black lines go, which is really really cool to me, um, you know. And then of course like surfacing takes a little bit longer, um, but as far as the like wireframe goes for a sketch, um, this is really fast tool which is awesome because you know it's been like 19 minutes no it's not even but it's been 19 minutes since we started but it's probably only been like 10 minutes since we've been in here let's see we've got curtis collab looks amazing if one person is moving the object around like crazy does it look that way to all the other users so the answer to that is um short answer is yes so you know if i were to I'm not gonna mess with what they're drawing right now, but um, I just drew this little surface and Austin and Nico can see this surface that I made back here. If I go ahead and grab it and move it, um, all of you can confirm that I've moved it over to this location. Um, and so that's one thing that, uh, one thing I like to say is um, imagine Colab pretty much like a virtual studio. Um, so everything is being updated in real time as uh, Nico's working and editing and drawing these points, um, that's happening in real time as Austin is up here um, editing and creating these, these, sketch, these sketch lines up above. And so it really is that real time collaborative creation experience. Um, and so we, we just like to say, you know, it's good to probably set some ground rules. Like, you know, maybe don't grab something if someone's working on a certain section, um, just like you would in real life, you wouldn't like, go and mess with something that someone's working on, you know? So it's good to set up some, some courtesy rules um, for the virtual space, we like to say as well. I um, also think um, you can lock your layers. So right. if you have like a layer that you have worked on that you don't want somebody else to touch, you can lock that. Um, and then it's pretty obvious to them that they shouldn't be touching it. Yeah, <laughs> and if they do, then, they're, then that's silly, but. <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's a good point. And so just keep that in mind whenever you invite people to your, your collab room as well, if you want to go out there and try it, um, that they will, you know, have the ability to, because um, I think we've now given the ability to everyone to unlock layers as well, um, if you have access to the room. So just keep that in mind. If people are in your room, they can, they can do whatever they want. Um, and so I, it's, I guess it's assumed that if you're giving them access to your room, that you trust them enough to, to, uh, treat your collab space with some respect and um, just like a, a, a real world virtual space. Let's see. Yeah, and I often like, if I'm designing something on my own and then I wanna bring it into a collab room to get comments from somebody or to work on further adjustments with someone else, I'll just keep that, um, I'll keep my own personal version saved separately on my own personal file so that if something gets messed up yeah. or changed, then I always have that to go back to. That's a good trick. That's a good tip. Cause we've had questions like that in the past. Like, you know, if I make something, I spent all this time, but I want to work on something else now, like in my collab room, 
with someone, like, do I just keep all this crazy work, you know, in this virtual space? Um, and you can do what Austin just said, where you can just save it out locally. And um, and I and, and going back to my analogy, I like to think of it very much like this, you know, uh, virtual studio where you're working on a project in the studio. Maybe once you've created something like a prototype, maybe you take it back to your desk, you take it home, or you take it to like another separate space, and then you use that collaborative studio to work on a new thing. So I would think of it in those terms. All right. This is awesome. It's looking really great. I'm also just going to show this reference imagery here too. You can have these reference images as well up on the wall, as many as you want. You got some detail shots here to help inform, I think, some of the details you guys are going to be working on. Yeah, I've never designed a rollerblade before. I've done mostly just traditional footwear. Um, so you've done just about everything, right? Even like boots, sneakers. Sandals. Yeah, I've done like winter boots, sneakers, sandals, dress heels, kids shoes of all sorts, rain boots, everything. But I've never, but I haven't ventured into rollerblades. You know, <laughs> this is like crazy to me. So that's another reason why I like having all those reference images. Yeah. I'm like, I want to make sure I'm doing it right and that I'm not missing some really important functional piece, you know? Yeah. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure it's maybe a little bit of a challenge, but I, I, I would imagine it's probably I mean, very, it's just very like familiar to territory. Yeah, especially because I've done like winter boots and stuff too. Like yeah. I'm very familiar with like padding and fill layers and all that sort of stuff. It's yeah. just- Yeah, um, it's basically a boot, right? Just wheels underneath. Oh, yeah. And there's bracing. There's very important yeah. bracing as well. But yeah. yeah. A little extra support for those the ankles and you've got the yeah. yeah, all the support all the support is in the ankle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why there's all this like build up design kind of of what I'm gonna do for like a molded piece in this back heel section. And then there's like the rest of it is like quite simplistic, right? It's just like these more solid pieces. And I guess you've got um, that added element of uh, hard details, like the, the locking mechanism or the tightening mechanisms. Yeah, I actually already pre-built some of those in here because oh, cool. um, oh, I knew yeah. it was gonna take a really long time to model like a boa. Um, I really like the, um, the idea of potentially doing a boa quick release system since this isn't like an aggressive inline skate, it's, um, it's for like leisure. So I feel like that could be really fun. And then I did um, these bindings as well because the binding I knew would take me a little bit longer to model. That's really and, cool. And then I can, you know, come in and like place it where I think I would want it and be like, does that look good? I don't know. This is a cool, I think, opportunity to just quickly mention that um, you can take the approach that Austin has done here where she's pre-made these objects and you could actually save these as prefab. So if you if you are working on a certain type of product or, or a larger project that re requires a lot of components that you think will be repeated or, or used a lot, um, you can create things in Gravity Sketch and save them and, and bring them in other sketches or other projects um, that can help you save you time, help, help you save time later. Um, so that's a good, I guess, like a little workflow tip um, for you if you just want to create some stuff. So if, if, and I'll just maybe show how to do that um, for, for anyone out there wondering. So if I just, you know, this is, you know, just a simple stroke here, but if I was like, you know, I'm going to use this a lot, I'm going to use this for so many projects and you want to save it, um, you can go over here to your prefabs and you um, grab, uh, go down to your import models uh, button here grab the object and then stick it right in here to make it a prefab until the box turns green. And then it'll ask you to name it. I'm not gonna actually save it because I don't need <laughs> this random stroke. Um, but basically after you name it and you check mark it, it's gonna be in your prefabs um, folder and then you can access that in any sketch, any collab room you're in and just drop it right in. And so that's what um, you know. You, Austin could do here with these uh, 
with these locking mechanisms if, uh, if she's going to be doing a lot more um, roller blade project roller blade projects um, you know and, and she wants to save that time down the line ah. so I'm actually doing this weird thing now where I'm duplicating the last so that I can make part of the upper um, directly off of the last. So I'm gonna hide the last itself. Oops, I put it, gotta put it on a new layer first. It makes like a crazy visual thing when there's two yeah. um, two things that are directly overlapping each other. But then um, I'm just going to go. It's basically trying to decide which one to display. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't like this. Uh, um, why can't I scroll down? Let me scroll. I'm going to turn that off periodically so that nobody gets. Love the detail in these wheels, too, by the way, Nico's. They're looking great. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty fun. You can make uh, pretty technical looking wheels very quickly. There we go. I'll turn the last off. And then turn. that on okay so i'm gonna offset this upper by like two millimeters about because the upper that i'm creating is going to have like it's it's a material right it's got an actual um thickness to it and so it's offsetting from what the actual last shape because of like the backer and everything that it has. Um, so now you'll see when I put that on a new layer and I lock the other one, I can just start like deleting pieces from this and the last is right underneath. And the reason I made these crazy colors is because um, it's easier to see. I call them flash colors. And the reason I'm using the upper to offset this as well is because um, as opposed to like just doing a surface of my own is because um, this upper follows very tightly. You can see that like the rollerblade upper at the bottom portion follows really, really tightly to the last shape. Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a nice technique that I've seen a number of times too, um, as well as like duplicating something and removing it to create sort of a sometimes like a two tone object, um, or in this case, creating different parts of the upper um, seems really effective. I think I forgot to bake it, which is why I was getting um, two two layers so this is also like fun with troubleshooting with austin and nico <laughs> <laughs> this is good though i mean because people are going to be running people are going to be running into these things too when they do them themselves so it's good to it's good to look at it in real time yeah so if you want to bake your offset you have to make sure or in order to get your offset to be a separate piece and not have two layers you need to make sure to bake it. Then I can put it on Austin 3. Oops. I think that's good now.
and if anyone has any other questions, um, things they're wondering about, workflow-wise, what Austin's doing, what Nico's doing, feel free to ask. I can see all your questions as they come through. Let's see, Jackster Stream says, when will you guys do a showing of character art or landscapes? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, we haven't done that in a while. Uh, we did, um, I do remember an interview that we did a year, maybe a year ago now uh, with, a, with a couple of concept, art, concept artists. Um, but it's been a, quite a minute since we've, we've shown that type of work. Uh, we might do something like that soon again because um, there is some amazing work being done in that in that sphere as well um some people doing some great character stuff great environment stuff so don't worry that'll be coming uh, again in the future uh, it's, it's just really a matter of um seeing someone we we want to highlight and um and they're they're definitely out there but uh, we haven't forgotten <laughs> That's one other thing too is that we're we're constantly amazed at the the applications and, and the usages that are being um, done with Gravity Sketch. Uh, it's 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 far beyond what we what we thought. It was eventually created, um, I think, in the very beginning, is to just kind of fill that unique spot of, of of designers being able to convey their ideas in 3D without having all this training um, and having all this expertise, um, you know, and years of training in a, in a particular piece of software, um, but they just want to get their ideas out. Um, and it's sort of, it's going and grown and, and expanded into all these other um, industries and workflows. So it's just really inspiring for us to see how everyone's using it. Let's see, LensCon says, our are you planning to make it possible to animate in Gravity Sketch VR? Um, that's a great question. We've definitely been talking about that. Um, that's definitely been a, one of those more highly requested or, or often, often requested things that we've, that we've seen from the community. Um, and I don't know the specifics, but we are, we are looking into that um, and at least discussing it. I don't, I don't know if there's like a, a an official initiative on that yet, but uh, it's definitely something we've talked about. It's it's certainly interesting, and there's um, I think we've seen a lot of um, reasons why that could be very beneficial and, and helpful for the creative process. And, and you know, back to what I was saying before with Gravity Sketch and the whole purpose and mission behind it is just being able to cr convey your your ideas. Um, in 3D as, as quickly and as, as seamlessly as possible. Um, we think this might fit into that, into that, uh, into that vision um, because part of being able to cr convey your idea is, is motion. Um, but again, this is very early conversation and, and uh, I don't know if there's been actually any time put behind this, but uh, it's certainly something that we've been talking about. Curtis says, what about design to 3D printing? Is it something that you guys have done or is this even possible? Um, yeah, to answer your question, Curtis, the answer is yes, you can definitely 3D print things out of Gravity Sketch. Um, as long as the surfaces or the, the, the surfaces you make are, are closed surfaces, um, they can be 3D printable. You don't really have to bring them in any of the software. You can just export them as like an OBJ and import right into your slicing software, whether it's Cura or Prusa Slicer or whatever you use, and it should be ready to 3D print. Um, and so uh, I just wanna, if anybody doesn't really know what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about when I say closed. Um, so this surface I just made here, this is not 3D printable because it doesn't really technically have any thickness to it. Um, but if I did something like I gave it thickness and I just went ahead and baked that. Um, let's get rid of that. This now has uh, some thickness to it. So you can see if I pull these points apart, this actually has um, an inside and an outside to it. 
put my headset in and I can see there's some thickness. This is 3D printable now. Um, all the strokes that you make, like uh, what Austin's doing here, these strokes, when you export them as OBJ, um, those are 3D printable technically as well, although it could be tricky to actually print. Um, you can print them uh, as they are just closed tubes, basically. Um, so to answer your question, Curtis, yes, you can 3D print things out of Gravity Sketch. And yes, we have done that. Uh, we actually did like a small TikTok uh, showing that process, but um, it's something that uh, I actually want to show more of. And so uh, we're working to show some more examples of uh, Gravity Sketch to 3D printing. We also have a cool little post on our Instagram as well of uh, someone in our community that, that printed a little model they made. Um, Nimish uh, says how to put a tangency constraint on strokes meeting at the mirror plane. That's a great question. Um, so with sub D, um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and turn my mirror on and, and show this. If I, oh, sorry. Yeah, turn on the mirror here and just go ahead and create this sub D surface. And if I connect them here at the mirror, um, they are tangent to each other because uh, a sub D surface is basically drawing, um, it's basically calculating the smoothest um, path between uh, points. So it's trying to create the smoothest path between essentially three points here. Uh, this point, the center point, and then the mirrored point on the other side. Um, and so you do get some tangency here whenever you uh, are working with sub D. Now, if you are working with a nerve surface, I'll just go ahead and draw like the same thing. If I draw it a nerve surface, I can connect it. But as you can see, there is no tangency here. Um, I can sort of get it close by moving these points where they need to be. Um, but it's not gonna be exactly perfect. As you can see, there's still a little bit of crease there. Um, if you wanna achieve uh, some tangency there with the nerve surface. Um, there's not really a way to do it exactly perfectly in Gravity Sketch, so you can eyeball it, like I just said. Um, but that is what I would say on the subject of tangency um, in Gravity Sketch. Let's see. Justin says, would love to see more of the 3D printing workflow. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely plan to show a lot more of that. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, actually a project right now as well to showcase an example of that. So we will be talking a little bit more on that subject of 3D printing just to, just to show people what's, what's possible. Um, but just to give you the short answer, um, anything you create in Gravity Sketch, you can 3D print it. You don't have to do anything else to it um, in any other program. As long as it's a closed surface, it doesn't have any holes, you can print it. So Austin, looks like you've got some um, some extra surfaces and details going here now, um, building out yeah. other parts of the shoe. It looks really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just kind of going in and um, adding surfaces to areas that that I know I want to build some stuff on. And um, you could see that I accident or not accidentally, purposely deleted some areas, and then um, that's just because I ran into. Um, an issue and like the most fun thing about this program is it's so fast to do things that sometimes it's even it's just easier to delete something and redo it because it's like two seconds either way yeah. than to um, try to figure out the problem because some you know topography is a very fun and complex uh, thing and idea so it and it, it is something like that is very, I think, learnable. It's very, um, the concept of how it works is easy to grab, grasp as far as like sub D and topology, but it is something that I've noticed it takes a little practice to where you learn where um, the more you do it, you the more you- Agreed. The yeah. more you learn how to solve areas, like I saw you were trying to like connect in these areas here where that you've got like this cut opening and you're trying to just like put it together almost like a puzzle. Um, and I, I think the more you, it, in my experience, the more you do these types of things, I would say you enter uh, an area like that and you're like, oh, okay, I know how to solve this because I've done this 
Exactly. Kind of it is. It's purely. It is just puzzle stuff, yeah. and um, it's like the more you do it, the better you are. You don't even have mistakes after you've done it for a while, you know. But yeah, I'm still new enough that I make mistakes. Yeah, and we're always learning. And I've been using this tool for like six years, and I'm still learning better ways to do things just by just by watching other people work in Gravity Sketch. Um, like there'll be a way that I do it, and then. I'll see like they do it like another way. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think of that. Um, and that's kind of the cool aspect too of like working in collab um, with friends or with colleagues. You can discover ways of working as well together, which has been, which is really cool. Um, All right, so question. Um, yeah. Do we want to go with an off-road version, which is what I've done here <laughs> with the chassis? These would be the little, little shocks and everything. Um, big pivot point, and these are air filled tires, or something more traditional. Um, so we have, let's see, Nico. I think this one. I think we need to go with the off road. I know. I'm like, I'm kind of <laughs> loving the exaggerated look of the off road. It seems like you've gone down this path of. It seems like it, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you you're a little inspired right now. So maybe I would say go for it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I mean, it's it. Rollerblade back in the day, Kahat did have an off-road skate, and it was really, really quite cool. Back oh, in like 2000, um, it was uh, like the I don't know if they, I don't remember if there were little shocks. I think there were, but most of it was like air-filled tires. And now there's only like one company that makes an off-road skate, so this would be kind of cool. I think you so. should do it. Break into the white space of off-road yeah, rollerblades. The mechanical engineering aspect comes out. All right. Let's go with the... Curtis says he votes off-road. <laughs> so. Well, okay. All right. We're that's all the, on the same page here. That's then. the one vote we've got, but I'd say that's enough. Let's see. Uh, Works for me. Can your session video audio be recorded from any participant's view? Um, so the only way to record uh, is if you're showing the video on some kind of desktop function. Um, and the, the only view you'll see is whoever's view is being shared. So there's not really a way to record um, every person's view in audio. Um, but I mean, you, you can't get everybody's audio if, if, they're, um, you know, if they're all obviously unmuted. But uh, yeah, let's see here. see here I'm just looking through some of your comments and questions can you do multicolor material prints through SLS printing um, so SLS printing um, I'm I don't think you can do multicolor I, with SLS I believe that's just one material that is because um, that's stereolithography so I, I believe that that's just one material that's being uh, hardened through uh, UV light or, or, or lasers. And I think that's only one, um, one material, but I could be wrong on that. So I would double check. Let's see here. Okay, so you say any print process. Uh, yeah, with powder printing, uh, I've seen multicolor powder prints um, which is basically just different um, color. Uh, Good old Z Corp. Yeah, it, you can definitely do multicolor powder prints for sure. Or another way you can do multicolor slash multi material is through uh, printers that have either multiple extruders uh, or their nozzle has multiple inputs that feed in like multiple filaments into one, uh, one hot end uh, where you could feed in sometimes two, sometimes four even, uh, materials and slash colors into, into it. So there's, that's more on the printer side um, of things where it, if it's equipped with the right hardware that can feed in multiple filaments, um, that would be a case in which you could print multiple uh, colors and multiple materials. 
um, which if you're all in, all interested, I, I believe uh, Prusa is coming out with a new printer. Uh, I can't remember what they call it, but it's a new printer they're coming out with that has five extruders. So you could have five different uh, materials feeding into, um, uh, that basically it swaps uh, the, the extruder head. You can create all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so Ken Peel's got a question. Uh, let me move everything up so I can read and show it at the same time. Um, on the workspace home view, a thumbnail of my model above the other options shows the model is facing away from me. I build according to the human prefabs. Um, Ken, maybe could you rephrase? I, I, I don't really know what your question is there. Um, apologies, I'm, I'm trying to interpret what you mean. Um, maybe you, you could rephrase the question. I, I'm not quite understanding. Uh, and then Justin's asking, do you guys have a suggested make model of a 3D printer for rapid prototyping footwear? Um, I'm assuming you're, uh, this is actually something that I've been <laughs> getting diving into myself. Um, so I, I do have a little bit I could say on this, which is um, with footwear, uh, I would say, if, especially if you're printing flexible materials, um, I would get a printer that has a direct drive uh, system as well as some sort of Titan extruder. Um, basically, you want that filament that's being pushed through the, the extruder to have the shortest path possible from the gear that's pulling it to the hot end that's pushing it out um, uh, because that's going to create the most optimum uh, optimum path for the for the filament and what's cool is we're in gravity sketch so I can kind of show you an example of this as well um, you know if we're just looking at the uh, you know this is our this is our hot and extruder um, and this is our filament being pushed through with with gears here like pulling it in pushing it in um, and it's coming out the bottom here. Uh, a Titan extruder, this path will be, this will all be all metal, and then um, the, let's see if I create another example here. Actually, I'll just duplicate this. Other extruders, um, this path will be a little longer um, because there's fans or it's just built differently, it has different cooling. Um, and the gears and everything are up here. And so uh, this is not good for flexible especially. And um, so I'll just keep that in mind. I would get something that's direct drive, which the gears are here and not, uh, not a Bowden setup. Sorry, these are like kind of a bunch of words I'm throwing out. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I would say just Google uh, printers that have uh, direct drive. Um, and uh, printers that uh, maybe have a Titan extruder or something like that. I think they'll be best for flexible. Um, printer I've been using is a printer from Sovol 3D, S-O-V-O-L. Um, there's another printer called Tenlog uh, that have basically do two extruders. Um, so there's a lot of options out there. It's, it's a really big subject. I would just go out there and do your research and, and Google um, Google best printers for, for 3D printing flexible filaments. And there's all all range of prices. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, this is just a, just a, a congratulatory or, or a positive feedback from Umbuto. Umbert, uh, it says, uh, I'm the senior product designer of the company who makes inline off-road today. And he said, oh, super cool. fun, super fun watching guys. Good job. So you guys are doing awesome. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you for those kind words. Um, Justin says the fast illustration you're doing is amazing. Example of power of gravity sketch. Yeah, this is great. It's awesome seeing guys work. Um, yeah, seeing this all come together. So, and I know what these company, oh, what sorry, company, ahead, Nico. what company is that? Oh, we can check out the skates. Yeah, uh, Umberto, what what company is that? 
good question. <laughs> you can write it in the comments there. Um, and I know, Austin, you said these colors are just to like help you separate things, but they're actually kind of, kind of working. <laughs> well, yeah, I generally <laughs> like to <laughs> pick colors that aren't like super ugly, you know, yeah. so, or that like, I mean, I like the whole retro vibe of these colors. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Know? That's what I was going to say. It's like, kind of like a 90s, almost 80s maybe even. Yeah, I don't know. I, I use, If it clashes too much, it hurts my eyes. So no, I, 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 to, yeah, I get it. I pick um, colors that I feel like at least remotely look okay together. Uh, Umberto says I think Jared, power slide. I think Jared, power slide? Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, they're the one. Yeah, that's awesome. Diz, Diz Royale. That's another one, I guess. What were you saying there, Nico? I, I said Power Slides. Power Slides the one. Like they're the they're the company that I know that that has one right oh, now. Cool. Yeah, the hopefully one. this is kind of showing a good example of. I mean, I think it is just basically. You know, in the, in the matter, I don't even know how long we've been going here, but already we've got a pretty solid design direction, I would say, that you guys have fleshed out. And, um, you know, this is in 3D. And this is data that you can export and bring into your traditional, you know, modeling workflow. If you want to send this off to your modelers, um, you know, you can send this off to into Alias, you know, Fusion, uh, SolidWorks. You know, this is data that you can continue using um, uh, in your other programs and, and work right off of. Yeah, I think the, the part that I'm doing right now where I'm just like separating surfaces is um, kind of a little bit tedious, but then the part after this, which we will probably get to in our next session, which is really exciting, is adding thickness to all of these materials so that you can kind of really see how they overlap with each other um, and how they work. At least for the upper. Yeah. Oh, Noah Wester says, uh, thank you for doing this live. It's helping me envision new ways to work with students as a team, not only to design together, but also to discuss existing designs and note desired changes while sketching. So yeah, a pleasure to, to, to be able to demo this for all of you. Um, and, and really thankful that all of you are watching live. Um, and I mean, that's the whole point of this. We just really want to show more ways of working, new workflows, um, ways you can use Gravity Sketch uh, for the work that you do, so. Exactly. Let's see. I'm making a spring down here using. Um, I love that. A pretty crazy method. You'll see it in a second. It'll, oh, it'll that's kind of interesting. That's um, wow, Nico. That's pretty cool. That's um, you'll have to talk. You'll have to explain that. Uh, I see. I see what you're doing, but I'd love for you to explain it. So, if you ever want to make like a circular uh, stroke, using a hexagon can really help you. If you use the the point mode on the stroke tool, and so what I'm do what I did is I made a hexagon shape using the revolve function. And then here, I'm going around and I, I, I duplicated that uh, hexagon shape in kind of a linear array and then moved it up. And so uh, what, what I'm doing here basically is using the corners and then every span basically I diagonally go up from one corner to another um, on each side of a hexagon. And that makes allows me to make kind of a, what do you call it? a um, helix shape uh, that um, is pretty cool. I, hopefully we'll Super get cool uh, a, like this is a trick kind of a workaround right now. Hopefully in the future we'll be able to make a, a helix function yeah. like where you can you could make a you know a spring shape really easily. Um, but for now with what we with what we have at our disposal this is kind of a, a, a quick little fun workaround. Um, That's what I was going to say was um yeah, hopefully we can build this out into a uh, functional like spiral tool uh, of some kind. Let's see. Um, 
Berto says, I have one issue by importing the OBJ files for FBX from 3D scanning. The texture completely lost every reference. Is there any way to keep it? So, okay. Yeah, so um, Berto, great question. Uh, there is a way to bring in textures from scanned data into Gravity Sketch. And essentially, um, what you need to do is you need to bring in the model, obviously the OBJ, into Gravity Sketch. Um, and then what you'll also need is you'll need that um, you'll need that diffuse map or that color map that is uh, exported um, from whatever software you're using. And you'll need the you'll need that in your reference images. And um, just to show you this this principle, how this works, um, you know. So I'm just going to show a simple example first. If I just create uh, a basic surface here, and then I uh, go to my images, and I just let's see if we just bring in like this random image of this castle. Um, now that it's in my scene, I can actually select it as a as a texture, and it'll be applied to my surface. So this principle is what will be used to apply those textures you're trying to bring in on your model. So what you'll do is, if we can, I'm trying to see if I still have the, uh, <laughs> I don't think I actually have it. Um, uh, basically, uh, you can apply that diffuse map onto scan data and it will wrap right onto the model. Uh, the way it's supposed to. And we've done some demos of this in the past. We have some videos on this on our YouTube. Um, but basically, you would just want that diffuse map in here. You would grab it, bring it into your scene, and then select it as a material on the model. And then there you go. You've got your, uh, you've got your textures and your colors. So unfortunately, though, I don't think I have those ready to go in my... Uh, yeah, I think the one thing to note to be like totally to, in order for it to work, you have to have the diffuse map. You have to have the model has to be like um, you have to have the like models UV map that's right. saved to the OBJ, and then you have to also have the MTL file. So all three right. of those things need to exist in order for it to work. Right. What what 3D scan data? Like what's it being scanned with though? Because like. Some of the iPhone apps, for example, um, if you have like a, an iPhone that can do the, the LiDAR scanning, um, the model will come right in uh, with very little issue. Um, but if you're using like a more high-end professional one, uh, you might have to do a little bit of trickery to merge everything. I think it's more about the textures than the model itself that they were having an issue with. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, is that, think, was yeah. that the question? Yeah, the question was, um, let's see, I'm just reading back. The texture completely lost every reference. So it basically just looks like bringing in the OBJ or the FBX, is, it's not bringing in the texture along with it. Um, and so, you know, Umberto, the way that we've done this is using the reference image technique that I mentioned. Um, where uh, all you do, all you need to do is, if if you can get that texture, if you can get that diffuse map, the one that's got the colors, basically, and the and it's a UV map. So if that if that model, that OBJ is has UV maps um, along with it, and you've got that diffuse map, which basically is just the color, the colors that are supposed to be applied to that model. Uh, if you have that file, which is usually a PNG image, um, and you put that in your reference images, you should be able to apply it as a material. Um, on your model. So um, we do have a video on this on our YouTube um, as well. Uh, if you want to go try and check that out, um, uh, it should explain this process. But, uh, but that is how you would do it. Um, let's see. All right. It's 2.01. I don't know if um, I have to go to another meeting. <laughs> Likewise. Unfortunately, yeah. Well, you guys have yeah. really done quite a quite a bit in this time frame. So, um, yeah, we won't waste um, really much more time. We're we're going to be uh, doing a, a follow up, right, 
on this. Yes, yeah. So, so we're it, hoping to do this as a series, mm -hmm. and we'll um, show more surfacing and detailing and stuff like that. Um, we'll just start where we left off. And, and get the colors to less uh, less Pac Man. Um, yes, eventually. the colors will so. will. Once I have all the surfacing complete, we'll change the colors to more understandable colors. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Austin. Thank you so much, Nico. This has been, I think, a super informative session. And uh, thank you all that's been joining joining us live. And uh, if you jumped in late, just go ahead and rewind it after the live's over. You can watch the thing, watch this video from the very beginning. And uh, make sure to tune in with us uh, again um, in the near future. I think we're working out a date still, but. Um, Keep on the lookout. We're going to do this again and, and continue on with the design. So thank you very awesome. much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you Thanks, now. Thanks, guys.